All right, <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started in the <clears throat> on a, our usual uh, Wednesday nights, we always spend time praying. And so if you have a prayer request, if you'd like to voice that, we'll, we'll, we'll take some time to pray. So prayer requests, anybody? <clears throat> Anybody else? We're making a yearly trip to New Mexico, so just pray for safe travel. Anybody else? School started. Miranda started yesterday, but it was just uh, at West Watkins. But actual school starts tomorrow so it'll go like that <clears throat> senior you're ready to go oh you so anybody else Got plenty of others <clears throat> in our bulletins and folks still recovering and um, church church wisdom or for wisdom for the church as we proceed church fan building um, a lot of things um, received a nice letter in the mail from Tim Green and uh, very encouraging. And uh, just made you feel good. Made me feel good. So, um, but let's go ahead and pray, and uh, we'll get into our study. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the day you give us. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for just the privilege it is to gather together as a church, a family, Lord, to study about you, how you operate in our lives and how we can grow closer to you and experience your presence. Father, we thank you for guidance and wisdom in dealing with uh, our needs as a church, that you would continue to guide us and open up doors of opportunity, things that we need, we know you can provide. We simply ask that you give us that Give us that utterance, that, that need for the church. Lord, many others are experiencing, still conti continue to suffer, Lord, uh, illness, sickness. Lord, we continue to lift those up as we are reminded of them. Continue to lift up Mike, Lord, that you would continue to bring about his healing. And others, Lord, uh, battling cancer, uh, other illnesses, Lord, even perhaps even COVID. We lift up Gloria to you, Lord, that you bring about her healing, continue to be her strength, and Lord, others in our church. Lord, others need just a fresh touch from you, Lord, to guide them in their lives. Lord, let us just be excited to live for you. And Lord, I thank you for the praise reports that come through and the encouragement for our church and, and hearing of good things. And Father, we thank you for uh, even last week, a good week at Falls Creek, Lord, that you continue to just 
grow that fervor for you in serving you. Thank you for loving us as we go into your study. Lord, I pray your guidance and just give us wisdom as we go through this. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> for the past few weeks, uh, we've kind of taken a, uh, a break, but I've tried to do some of the study uh, on Sunday morning. And so uh, we looked at a few things and uh, as far as God's attributes and uh, if my phone will stay on. <clears throat> uh, but some of the things that we mentioned are very vital to what the scriptures say about God. But not only God, but how He relates to us. And that's kind of what the attributes do. Uh, when we first started this study before Vacation Bible School, uh, we, we mentioned that the attributes tell us how we can connect with God on a personal level. And uh, throughout Scripture, we see His dealings, we see His activity with man, uh, we see His interventions, miracles, um, all sorts of things of where God has shown Himself. Uh, and one of the most important ones that we, that we first started with was uh, talking about God's holiness. <clears throat> there's a passage or there's a, little, there's a, a phrase I want to read to you about holiness. And it is that, and we said this the very first week, the standard of all morality is God's absolute perfect holiness. Again, a standard of holiness. Uh, that, that morality is absolute. Uh, there's no error. There's no opinion about it to, to change anything about it. It's just absolute holiness. Uh, throughout Scripture, I believe in Exodus chapter 3, verse 5, that's where we saw the, uh, the conversation between Moses and God in the, as the bush burned. He said to take off your shoes from off thy feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. And so we see that element that God speaks of of himself, that he's a holy God. I believe it's in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2. Uh, it talks about, uh, let me just read it real quick. Let me see if I can find it. But it speaks of God's holiness in response to Hannah's prayer. And in that, 1 Samuel 2, verse 2, it says, There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. But again, throughout Scripture, you see various uh, scenes or stories or uh, events that show forth God's holiness. Uh, one of my favorites to study is about the tabernacle. If you've ever studied the tabernacle, you get a glimpse of God's holiness. You get a, you get a glimpse of maybe what heaven will be like someday. Uh, even though it was a place on, on, the, on the planet, on the earth, uh, you see God's instructions. They're very specific. Uh, to build it this way, to adorn it in certain ways, again, as a reflection of His holiness, perfection. Uh, but yet God wanted to dwell with man. He wanted to have that fellowship with man. And so, but yet there was that element. It had to be that of holiness. And you see, you see a lot of the different things that He puts forth in the tabernacle because, again, the tabernacle is a representation of who Christ is. Holiness, absolute holiness. And eventually we see, we, you see within the, uh, the tabernacle, you see the sacrifice. You see, you see God's activity in, in, in forgiving sin. And so eventually later on, 2,000 plus years later from that Old Testament uh, event, you see the birth of Christ, you see His life and ultimately his sacrifice and him giving himself on the cross for us as a perfect sacrifice, absolute sacrifice. And so, uh, again, that, uh, that phrase, uh, 
Anything that falls short can never measure up to proper fellowship with God. Holiness. <clears throat> My phone doesn't, I, I haven't set the setting so it keeps going off, but God is holy. The second one that we talked about is that God is faithful. When you think about faithfulness, you think of uh, something that's true. You, you think of something that's going to be uh, just there. I mean, it, 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 you know, faithfulness is just something that you count on. And, and when you look at Scripture, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 says, He who promised is faithful. That's a good verse to remember. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 he who promised is faithful. And that simply allows us to have total confidence in every promise that He's written down for us in His Word. And uh, it, 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 it ought to generate for us a, a less anxious future because we know God is ultimately in control. Uh, <clears throat> all my life, I've always... I've always kind of thought, and, and sometimes I'm a deep thinker. Um, sometimes I'll just go and sit outside and just think and just wonder. Um, sometimes if Miranda, Miranda takes a lot of uh, math classes and she's taking physics this year. I mean, I've had physics before, but I, I've begun to study, to, to think about what I, I, what I can remember from 35 years ago. Um, but she's also got trigonometry, and so uh, trigonometry was easy for me, but I, and I understand it, and I was, I was just giving her some principles, but I, I like to think about things like that. I think I like to think about and wonder uh, about God, because even at a young age, I was a skeptic. Even when I was a kid, I had a lot of questions, and um, I, asked, I asked my Sunday school teacher, I think I was 10 years old, I asked my Sunday school teacher, I said, if God knew we were going to sin, I said, and God hates sin, I said, why did, you, why did he create us anyway? You know, basically, she just said, well, that's just what the Bible says. You know? <laughs> uh, to me, that didn't answer my question. But as I continue to think about things, about what God's sovereignty is all about, God's provisions, God's promises, God's initiative, uh, I see it more in a light that you know, there are those things that uh, I might not know, but God does give everyone an opportunity to trust Him, to believe in what He says. We can't sit there and figure out, well, that person won't make it. You know, this person won't, won't, go, won't go. Or how do, you, how do you know you're going to be? So how do you know you're going to go to heaven? All, and all these questions. And so I wrestled with those things. And um, I didn't get saved until I was a little after 10 years old because I, 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 I had questions. But when you think about God, one of the greatest things to know is that He is faithful. Uh, we don't have to worry about God just saying, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry you so far and leave you. Or I'm going to just, I'm going to save you and you're on your own. Uh, the scriptures tell us more about that. It, it tells us more about what God does for us once we're his children. We have these promises. They're, they're intact. They're not just subtle things. They're set in concrete, if you will. And... They're for us. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, sometimes I bounce a lot of things off my, my wife's uh, uh, mind, her heart, uh, because she does a lot of counseling and I talk to her about things. And, um, and we talk about depression. We talk about anxiety. We talk about things and, 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 and what people face and what scriptures say. And she basically, she told me, she said, well, she said, what I understand on the psychological side and what the clinical side says is that a lot of things are biblically important, biblically inspired ways that God has enabled us to experience those things. Because again, you know, 
she sees a, she sees a lot of people that are Christian folks that are having difficulty uh, with their anxieties or you know things about depression the the, the perhaps the uh, trauma the trauma of past things that they had to go through um, just several things but also anxieties about what what may come but as we think about God and maybe what she ha she has to substitute as a psychological tool, you know, we look at it and look at it as scripture. What God? What does God say? Because He does have a plan for everyone's life, even though as difficult as it may come, tough times. You know, like um, <clears throat> down at Falls Creek, we heard some good testimony about what took place in people's lives, like Brother Allen on Tuesday Tuesday morning. He spoke of his time going to prison and jail. You know, sometimes we think about that as being he's off the grid, but he wasn't off the grid. He was right where God had planned for him to be, to get him to where he wants him to be. As difficult as it was for him, God showed favor upon him through all that time. And even Brother Jay, I, <clears throat> I, knew, I, knew, Jay, I knew Jay at the time when he began to... Uh, have his conversion experience because we were we worked down there in Chicago Association some of the churches my brother pastored where he became a Christian down in Ardmore so I knew what his life was like before and uh, kind of knew what what took place you know they a lot of prayers for that young man because of his troubles but um, what you see again is God's faithfulness even in the difficult times that he faced that's where he had to be. Sometimes we don't like the thought of trouble. We don't like the thought of tribulation. We don't like the thought of having to suffer. But sometimes that's where God allows us to be and able to grow us. Because again, you know, what, the, what was that old saying is that uh, <clears throat> we want to be on the mountaintops. We, we like to be in the heights, uh, the heights of worship or the heights of enjoying life. But all of a sudden, here come, there comes the valley. And it's in the valley where it's, we, we talk about it being difficult. Uh, but they say in the valley, what do they say? That's where, the, that's where the grass grows the best, or that's where the grass grows the tallest. Uh, it, it, it becomes a growing experience. I read something back, um, it's been a while back, but it was, it was a line, it was a line out of the Ten Commandments. And if you'll remember, if you remember the movie, it was where Moses was banished until the wilderness. And as he, you know, they gave him a, they gave him a staff and they sent him, they banished him out to the wilderness and he started walking away. And in that time to the time where he, 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 he went and found himself at, at the well, you know, fighting off that, those, those, those guys and the sheep and all that stuff, the narrator, I can't remember his name, but the narrator was talking and talking about how God shapes a man. I, I wish I had that with me. I'd read it to you, but because it's it it, it 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 inspires me, because I've been there. I've experienced some of those. Maybe not the hard times, but you know, I I, I couldn't relate to those guys, but I can relate to them in knowing that God is always faithful. You know, they they talk about their alcohol, their drugs, and all that. You know, see, I'm. I'm 59 years old and I've never had a taste of alcohol in my life. I've never even smoked a cigarette, you know. I've never drank coffee. Uh, I don't drink tea, you know, things like that. There are some things I've just never do. I never do. Um, <clears throat> but again, God is faithful. Again, He's not going to turn aside. He'll always be there. He'll always know what's going on in our life, as small as it may be, as as, as small and maybe insignificant we may think that we are, God holds us high because we're faithful. <clears throat> He's also, again, that, that verse is Hebrews 10, 23. God is omnipotent. And I'm going to try to finish these all here in about 20 minutes. First, or 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. If you, gotta, if you can write that one down. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says, His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life 
and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Notice that verse again. It says, his divine power. Uh, is God limited in his power? He's not, is he? He's not limited. Sometimes the limitation comes from us. We begin to think, oh, God can't help me. God's not going to do this for me. And I've even had people pray or ask for prayer. And sometimes they say, <clears throat> well, Brother Randy, God didn't do anything for me. God didn't heal me. I said, well, maybe that wasn't God's plan for your life. I said, I don't know what God's plan is for your life. But maybe he didn't, that, that's not your, his plan for you. They kind of take it kind of harsh, you know. They, what? I thought, I thought when you prayed, God would heal or God would do this. I said, well, I said, Jesus in the Bible met men who needed him, but they walked away from him. Everyone that he encountered, not every one of them turned to him in the scriptures. And he was there in person. But God is omnipotent. Let me get my page back here. He is, it's his power. His omnipotence is all, what, what you would consider all powerful in nature, in being. It's necessary. As human beings, if we weren't connected to the power lines of God's omnipotent grace, we are in deep trouble. And if we aren't living daily in his power, we're poor testimonies of the Christian faith. We need his power for victorious Christian living and effective Christian service. It's his divine power. You know, I can't live out there on my own. I can't do things on my own as well as, as much as I think of myself as, as a, uh, one who believes in morals, high moral value. Um, I can't do that on my own. You know, I came, I came close to losing my, my False Creek joy uh, Friday night, last Friday night. Um, <clears throat> but it's things that, that we encounter daily that speak of God's omnipotence. Again, all power, all powerful. The third or the fourth one, Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verse 16. Psalm 139, 16 says, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. As you sit here tonight, have you ever thought that God knew you were going to be here 2,000 years ago? Eternity years ago? God knew you, you were going to be. You were in His plan from, a, from infinity beyond. He knew who you would be. He knew your uniqueness. He knew everything about you. He knew your hang-ups. He knew what can anger you. He knew what makes you happy. He knows what makes you excited, perhaps even angry. He knew you. And in His Word, He, said, he tells us here, again, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. Um, a lot of times I think about my life and my family, especially my mom and dad. Um, I was the oldest, oldest kid in our family, and um, I, saw, I saw some things about their life, about their, um, their Christian lives, uh, and I also saw some of their struggles. And a lot of times I would base who I am on them. But I also think a part of my life is what God already knew I would be way before I was ever formed in the womb. God knew who I would be. God knew my trials. God would know what, what would cause me tribulation in my life. My weak points. You know, <clears throat> sometimes I, I, I see, I hear those testimonies like that at Falls Creek, and I'm, and I'm glad I never had to experience that. Um, some people say, oh, you're missing out. You're missing out on all the fun. You know, no, no, I'm not. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Um, 
it's kind of funny, but they, you know, I said, I do have an addiction, but it's, uh, I have a Bigfoot addiction, you know, but it uh, <clears throat> doesn't cause anybody pain, you know, or anything like that, maybe me someday. But those things that I look at and see in my life, I think way before I was ever conceived, or even before my mom and dad thought about getting married and having kids, God knew that I would be. God knew and he had a plan for my life, just as he does for you. He has a plan. He wants to execute that plan in your life. Even if it looks cloudy up ahead, unsure, God wants to work a plan through your life. What's the best way to do it? Just get in there and go. Serve. Get into his word. Pray. And you might think, well, that, is that all there is? Is that all there is? No. God has plans for your life. The things that, 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 that I see and I look back and how God provided certain things and things to happen uh, is nothing short of a miracle. Uh, the other day we were in Shawnee and we were at Arvest Bank. And um, I went inside and I came back out and I saw Mike Wester. You know Mike, anybody know Mike Wester? I know some of you know Mike Wester. And um, I was talking to him and I said, man, I said, I said, I remember when your dad passed away and we was talking about that. And, and, um, and I said, did you ever know what he did for me? And he said, no, because we had, we had a philosophy class with his dad as the instructor at OBU. And um, I told him my story that I didn't have the money to buy books. And he saw me in the library in the reference section uh, the night before class and was asking me what I was doing. And so I told him I didn't have money for books. And so I said, short story, he ended up, Dr. Wester bought my books. Every year I was at OBU, every semester he bought my books for me. He didn't have to, I told him you didn't have to, I, you know, I, I was okay, but he did it anyway. And so, you know, I, I made philosophy a co-major for myself at OBU. Um, it was tough, but in appreciation, he, he did some things, he did some correspondence teaching for me so I could graduate. Um, but uh, I told him that story and it started making him cry. And he said, I needed to hear that. I said, yeah, I don't know if you ever knew. He said, no, I didn't. I said, but your dad blessed me. I said, but more than that, God used him to help me. Because I knew when I look back, I, I, I went to OBU just kind of in ignorance. I never even applied to go to OBU. I got a phone call living in Aid, Oklahoma, and said, we'd like to have you come to our facility and show you. Maybe we can get you into school. Maybe we have time to get you to start this semester. You know, I never applied there. So I went <clears throat> anyway. Somehow they had my name. They had my information. You know, that, you know, they didn't have the Internet stuff today. And I always kind of wonder how in the world did they ever get me in? But I got in. I enrolled. And I was scared because I didn't have, I, I saw people writing checks for six and seven hundred dollars for one, for, for a quarter of a semester. Dad gave me fifty dollars and he said that's all I got. When they dropped me off I had my clothes, gave me fifty dollars and I checked into the dorm and when I got there I, I, did, I, I was about to walk out because I was next in line and I didn't have the money. I said payment was due at least a quarter. But God was faithful. God was sovereign. And when I was the next in line, this lady comes and says, oh, there you are. She said, you're hard to find. And so she called back to her office. I signed a few forms. And most of my semester was paid for. I didn't even apply for scholarships. I got one that was for vo Christian vocation. Uh, other ones I got. When I graduated from OBU, <clears throat> I had $4,000 left over in my account and it paid, everything was paid for. I only see that as God's provision for where he wanted me to be. To me, that was a miracle. 
because at one time I was, I was, I was hustling for money because I didn't think I, my last semester when I was a senior at OBU, I didn't have the money, to, I didn't have the money to pay off the last semester. <clears throat> but through some things that happened, I went ahead and they let me enroll and somewhere a large amount of money came to my account. It paid off all the fall, it paid off all the spring. Went to school and I had that $4,000. I don't know where the money came from. I don't know. But I had $4,000 left over at the end of the semester. I bought myself a camera. <laughs> but uh, again, God does things in our, and, and again, you might think, man, that, that's a pretty much a big miracle. I wonder why nothing ever happens to me like that. It could. And it probably has. Just recognize it. Think about your life. Take an inventory of what God does. Because again, God is faithful. He's omnipotent. He's his power. Uh, if we simply trust it. Um, I know this is going to sound kind of odd. I'm not trying to be materialistic. But my truck, um, my wife kind of gave me the green light. She said, if you want to get you a truck, go ahead and get your truck. Because we had our other car for about seven years, paid off everything. She said, but if you want to get you a car, or get you a truck, because she said, I know you've been wanting a truck for a long time. Man, I was looking through everything. I was looking, I was searching websites for trucks. And the first one, well, <clears throat> there's a guy who works at Joe Cooper, Shawnee. His name's Mo. <laughs> I don't know if anybody knows Mo. He's from Wetumpka. His wife is from Wetumpka. Anyway, I get a letter from him because we already knew him. And he sends me a letter. And he said, you want to upgrade your car? But I read that letter. I said, I don't want, I don't want the same car. And so I, 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 I emailed him back and I said, well, I, I'm looking at something different. I don't want that same car. So he sent me a picture. He said, how about a truck? And that picture was my truck and I thought oh man I'd love to have that truck because I I had been looking at it online looked at the website but it was all the way in uh, Yukon I think the Yukon dealership I saw it but I didn't want to travel that far to go see it and so I didn't really worry about it three four months later it was still there three four months later still there and so me and Miranda she had a track meet at Luther and uh, it was on a Friday. I said, let's just drive by there. You know, we, we, she was done with the track meet. We was on our way home. So I, I stopped and I saw that truck sitting up there near the front of the store. And I looked through my phone. And I said, that's the same truck I've been looking at. So we got out. And I, I actually got her picture on here on my phone, her standing next to that truck. Just kind of hoping, you know. And so long story short again. Uh, they said, you like that truck? I said, yeah, I love that truck. So they let me drive it. Uh, Miranda loved it. And I said, but I, I said something like this. I said, we always talk about this with my, with my family, my, my wife. So she went and looked at it. And uh, they said it would be this amount of money every month. And so it was a little too much. And so I thought, well, I'll drop down to the Ranger. You know, the smaller truck, a little bit more affordable. But Kirsten said, she said, well, what, what would you take to get you into this truck? And she just threw out a number. And it was like, oh, they're never going to give us that truck for that much. I just knew it. But I said, well, so he said, well, let me go work on some. Well, the trading value for our car was only like $3,000. So they reworked everything. And I, I, I don't know if it was just to get me to buy it. But they came back and gave us nine thousand dollars on that on that other car we had, just to make it work. Because they said we need to sell this truck. We need to get it off the because it's been here so many days. And I told Kirsten, I said that truck's been here so many days because it was meant for me. Yeah, I was kind of laughing, but I wasn't really. I, I I knew. I prayed about. And again, it's not to be materialistic, but that's how I see God working in our lives. Uh, I. You may think it's funny, but I pray for good deals when I go shopping, like those shoes I showed you on Sunday. I pray about those things because, again, I don't like to spend a whole lot of money. But 
things I need. But again, God is, God is faithful. He's sovereign. Uh, he's omnipotent. Again, it's his power. Um, and according to a lot of testimonies, you know, a lot of people pray because, man, they get afflicted with disease. And, and, and that's not fun. That's not, uh, it's terrifying for a lot of people. And they ask us to pray. They ask me to pray for them and stuff. And, um, you, know, you know, I tell them, you know, well, I said, we'll certainly pray. I said, but, you know, for, for some, it's a, it, it's, it's late. The stages are late sometimes when they, when they get to call. Um, like, for example, uh, Letha. Many of you know Letha. Um, she was having some pains and such. And when she came back and told me at work, um, she was crying. And uh, she told me it was stage four uh, and not, not a good diagnosis. And she said, can you pray for me? And I said, well, I said, let me tell you this. I said, will you be satisfied with wherever God leads you in this diagnosis? And she said, yes. And I said, so I, wanna, I don't want to sound negative, but if this is what brings you to life's end, are you okay with that? And she sat there for a while and she said, yes. Because then she started talking about her life, different things happening, grandchildren, everything. And I said, well, I said, let's pray. I said, God will either heal you or this may be another way that our life can end. I said, I'm not going to lie to you. I said, my sister had colon cancer. And I said, we prayed for her. I said, day and night. I said, but she still passed away. I said, God can do the miraculous. He can certainly heal. But sometimes that's just in God's plan because eventually we're all going to die of something. You know, we're just human. We're just physical beings. We're going to die someday. That healing will only be temporary. But nevertheless, we'll pray. Because again, God is powerful. God is omnipotent. And so we prayed... She's doing better. Uh, I don't know what the long-term diagnosis or continued prognosis or be or whatever that word is about what holds for the future, but uh, she knows there are things that are settled in her heart about the disease, but also about her future life and how long life may be for her. And so I had that same conversation with my sister. Um, and we talked about things of that nature. But again, God is powerful, but he's also eternal. Psalm 139, or again, he says, your eyes saw my substance being yet in form. God lives outside of time, and yet he controls it. Again, sometimes I, I go outside and I just look at, you know, for one thing, I got to take the dog out, and it's dark where we live. And sometimes I just look in the heavens while he's doing his business. And, you know, I think about how, how distant those stars are. I think about eternity. I think about the magnitude of space. And I think as, as, distance, as, as distance as those things are, God is eternal. God spoke, simply spoke all those things into existence. And I was... I was talking to Miranda one night, and we was, talk, we was looking at the uh, constellation Scorpio, or Scorpius, and it's in the southern sky right now. We talked about a certain planet, or actually a star, I'm sorry, and how huge that star is, but yet it's so far away, it's like just a little speck in the sky, you know, almost a thousand light years away, but it's so huge. If that star was where our sun is, that outside of that star would reach out to the, to, to the planet Mars. That's how big that star is. And yet our, our, our sun is 93 million miles away. That's how huge that is. But even in that, God provided that to 
mirror his sovereignty, to mirror who he is, to show forth his glory in the heavens. The third one, or the next one, sorry, in Psalms 102, Psalm 102, verse 25 and 27. It says, of old, you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment, but you are the same and your years have no end. This is that one word that we had talked about, about Googling it or looking it up for side study. And that word is immut immutability, that God is changeless. Um, God is still holy. The standard is still there. It's unchanged. Uh, even in today's culture, um, the cancel culture wants to minimize the standards of Scripture. They want to minimize it to where it doesn't have an effect over one's life or the, the, what, what people do. So that cancel culture wants to, wants to, wants to take that part out. But again, Scripture is, is complete in knowing that God is changeless. He doesn't, he doesn't waver. He doesn't change. He doesn't change his mind, his heart, about how or what righteousness is, how it's defined. It's still going to be the same. And it's in standard with his attributes, his holiness, his power, his sovereignty. All these things, that immutability, changelessness. One, I, I mentioned this other one in one of my sermons about saying that God is good. You know, sometimes you hear that little phrase, God is good, and some will reply that he's good all the time, uh, and all the time God is good. Um, there's an actual good study about the goodness of God. Um, scripture refers to when the rich young ruler... Um, was confronted by Jesus and he had all the wealth and he had a lot of stuff going for him but yet he turned his back he said that he was a follower of the Old Testament scriptures he was a follower of the Ten Commandments which actually well, there was I think just seven of them or six or seven that he actually said he was faithful to but Jesus pointed out some things in his life but yet he walked away sorrowful um, but one of the things it talks about that he, Jesus brings out about himself, he says, why callest thou me good? There's only one that's good, and that's God. What people were calling him, he always turned it back to God. Not saying that he wasn't worthy or that he, he wasn't good, but God was that reflection of who he was and his character. And that was goodness. Uh, he's generous. Uh, in that goodness. He's purposeful in that goodness. <clears throat> uh, there was a big conversation that was held. <laughs> and it's about a song, one of the popular Christian songs of today. Uh, but it's been popular for a couple of years. And it's that song where it says, uh, talks about God's reckless love. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know the name of the song, but uh, it says that God, God's reckless love. And I, I get, I don't know. But there was a conversation about that word. And somebody, one of, the, one of the preachers, popular preachers out there today, asked me. We're kind of like, we have like a side chat here and there. They said, Randy, is God's, reckless, is God's love reckless in uh, pursuing us? I said, personally, to me, God's love is purposeful, not reckless. You know, what we, what we think of reckless, you know. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe what the art, artist's words were were maybe, maybe different than what we think about being reckless. I said, but if you look at it just at face value, God is purposeful in His love. God is has something in mind, and it's not just reckless, you know, just reckless. But again, those are some of the kind of the theological questions that we talk about. Uh, Psalm 145 says, I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great, good, your great goodness and shall, shall sing 
of your righteousness. Again, everything that God is, all that God is, with all these attributes, if you'll think about that scripture where it says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, the glory of God. You know, some people, that they say, well, what does that mean, the glory of God? Again, when you take in the whole of all of those attributes, put them together and try to fashion it, mold it into ways that we can identify and how scripture and what scripture tells us about those things, that's what you may consider the glory of God. Because again, it's ultimate, it's supreme, no error, faithful, forever, eternal, immutable, unchanging. That's the glory of God. So that verse that comes up, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, what does that mean? Now, I have, I've, had, I've heard a lot of people say it's like a target, but that's the description of sin. But again, the glory of God is all that God is. Uh, next one, omniscient. <clears throat> uh, Psalm 147, verse 5, Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. Um, Omniscient simply means that all-knowing, uh, all-knowing, know everything. Um, I like to study. Um, I like studied scripture. I also like studying things, you know. Um, sometimes my wife asks me, what are you studying, or what are you looking at? Uh, so I'm, you know, it's like a classroom on, the, on YouTube. They said, what are they doing? I said, <clears throat> math problems. No. And so I, I watch YouTube videos of how, how to do a calculus problem or how to do a trigonometry problem. And so I'll sit there and I'll just watch it. And to, you know, to me, and th it's probably the most boringest thing that my wife could ever, you know, she just walks away. But I enjoy that. I like to watch the classroom instructor. How do you solve this problem? How do you, how do you work this problem? Or, or, you know, what, you know, but that to me, to me that's interesting. Because um, when in our, in, our, in our bedroom, there's the Golden Girls or there's the Gilmore Girls, you know, <clears throat> those shows. I have to force myself to watch those, okay? I just, I just can't get into them. But uh, my wife loves those shows. But in the same way, we have things that interest us. But here, the scriptures tell us that God is all-knowing. God knows all those things. And I'm glad she knows because she thinks my, you know, the videos that come up on my YouTube thing, you know, it's, it's either math problems or Bigfoot. You know, that, that's what I watch. Interests me. She knows that. But there's also those things in our life with God being omniscient. He knows all things. He can identify with you. He can, he, he can know what's in your heart, even if you can't express it in prayer. He knows those things. He knows where you're weak. He knows where your strengths are. He knows where the weaknesses lie. But He knows. But He also knows that when we, when we fail, He knows that He'll be there to lift us up. Omniscient. <clears throat> The last two, uh, Genesis eighteen twenty-five talks about the sovereignty of God. Um, when you talk about tribal sovereignty, what does that mean? When you've, when, especially when the McGirt decision came through, tribal sovereignty became a big word. So what does that mean? Anybody tell me? He was in a law class. Brianna, what sovereignty mean? Do 
Did y'all hear? I couldn't hear that fans in my ear, but sovereignty, again, I know what I couldn't hear what she said, but I'm sure you heard it. <clears throat> but in in just a small box, sovereignty means the tribe is in control of its own affairs and with through it the interpretation of its laws, <clears throat> governing itself. Um, God is sovereign because again, He's over everything. Everything. Think about that. There's nothing outside of His guidance. There's nothing outside of His, uh, <clears throat> his purposes. You know, <clears throat> we had a discussion I don't have time. It'll take another hour. But we have discussions about different things about creation, uh, how God did things. Why did God do this? You know, why did God create that mountain over there? Why did God create this river over here? Why did God create the why did why why is the Grand Canyon there and all these other things, you know? Um, God is sovereign. I, I don't know the I don't know the answers. Um, there was one time we went we went on a church mission trip. At, from First Baptist in Okima, we went to Chinle, Arizona, and we took mostly native folks or members from our church and went to Chinle. And um, one day after our VBS and such, um, we went to the uh, Canyon de Chez. I think that's how you pronounce it. We went down to that canyon, and you, there's one part you can walk, take a trail. You walk down and it, the elevation is really high. It's like 7,000 feet in elevation. But you walk down into that canyon. <clears throat> it's about two miles down in there, but it's, you know, it's very steep. The, the air is thin. But you get down to the place and there's the walls of those canyons have dwellings, ancient dwellings. And uh, me and the pastor and a couple of other guys, we were just sitting there talking and, and they said, why do you think those people lived in those caves way up there? They start talking about different things, you know, and primitive things. And, and um, I said, uh, they wanted to keep out of the reach of the dinosaurs. And they looked at me like, I never thought about that. Because they used to find a lot of the fossil beds at the base of those cliffs. They said, "How do? What about? What about those?" And I said, "They they probably made them. They probably made those dinosaurs chase them to make those dinosaurs fall off the edge and die and eat them." You know, to me, it 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 was like common sense because I I, I threw that out there, and then the the Grand Canyon guy, the guy that was walking around, I said, I asked him a question. I said, "Did?" Uh, I said, did that river form the Grand Canyon or did the Grand Canyon form the river? And he said, I never thought about that. But things of that nature, when we think about the sovereignty of God, why is this mountain here? Why is it over there? You know, um, you know as I look at scripture, I try to find an avenue of truth. And like for me, like the mountains, the great mountain chains, um, to me, it's a result of when Noah's flood, if you'll remember, if you recall that part in the book of Genesis where it says the fountains of the deep broke open. Uh, to me, that's what I feel like is what created a lot of the mountains and the peaks and the valleys and such back during the times of Noah. But again, that's just me. But God is sovereign. He's omnipresent. That means he is everywhere, and there is nowhere he is not. He's everywhere, and there is nowhere he is not. He's omnipresent in his universe. You know, there's, a, there's a telescope view that they say we, the, the, this tele, telescope focused on one part of the universe, and there's almost nothing there for billions and billions of light years. Nothing. This is a view into nothingness. 
So I was trying to read out what they were talking about. They said, of all the expanse of the universe, there's nothing hardly there. But yet, again, according to what Scripture says, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere, even where there's nothing. And for our lives, even, even though we may feel like we're far from God or, 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 or God's not near, He's as near as a whisper for us at any time. Any time we have a need, He's there. He's available. Sin has that effect that where if, we, if we're in sin or the habitual sin that we're engaged in, it makes us feel away far from, far removed from the Lord. But yet a scripture tells us that we're as close as a prayer of repentance away. And the last one is that God is loving. He loves us as we are. You know, I used, I, I used to have the notion that I had to get to a certain point in my life where I could serve. Now, there, there's, a, there's an old saying that says God, let's see, how's it go? The, the, mistaken, the mistaken statement says that God calls the qualified, but He doesn't. He qualifies the called. I know that's, that's, that's an old statement that's been around a long time, but God doesn't call the qualified. If He did, none of us would be in charge. None of us would do what we do. But God simply calls and then qualifies the called. You know, I've had to learn a lot. I'm still learning a lot about who He is, His purposes in my life. And I'm thinking, man, I'm pressing 60. Is this what it's about? If it is, I'm totally happy. I'm totally satisfied with what God is doing right now. If this was the rest of my life and my life ended next week, I'd be totally, I'd be totally satisfied all of all that God has done for me now. If that's been my purpose, I'm happy. And I, you know, at times I, I, I've talked to my wife about funerals and about my funeral and you know I never did like talking about it but I do you know what would I do where would I where would I want to be buried you know and um, coffin color you know just different stuff because I know that I would like to live maybe as long as my dad hopefully I got his genes you know he he lived to well he was almost his mid 80s um, but if not it's okay um, Mom died. She was only 66 when my mom died. And, um, you know, all those things kind of speak to you at times. But again, I, I've seen and experienced enough of God's plan to know that whatever avails is okay with me. Um, I've done some things in my life to prepare my daughters uh, financially. Um, <clears throat> They're set if anything was to happen to me. But again, God's attributes, th these things, and there's, there's, there's more. But again, the attributes are there to tell us how we can identify with the Savior. How to live expectantly instead of anxiously. How to live victorious instead of in defeat. Those attributes draw us, should draw us closer to Him and His presence. Again, my wife, she calls me the ultimate bargain shopper. Because you know? <clears throat> I can find a bargain. You know? But I do those things because that's, <clears throat> again, that's, that, that's what I just enjoy doing. But I love what God has done in my life. And everything I, I, I look at, even from as a child, things happened in my life to bring me up to today's chapter, the continuation of the book of Acts for my life. Acts, the book of Acts, when you read the book of Acts in the Bible, it's an, it's an open book. It has never ended, it's never closed. The Acts continue in today's church, and that's what we're all about. So let us strive, let us, let us continue to strive to know God and who He is 
when we understand, have a better understanding of that, we can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the doubters. We can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with those who preach the false gospel. We can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe and not be afraid to say, this is what, who God is. Even the atheists, this is who God is. So let's pray and let these things become more real to us as we continue. Because the next one that we're going to look at is Scripture. The next big section that we'll look at is Scripture. And then we'll look at the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, So let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for the day you give us. We thank you for your love. We thank you for how you reveal yourself to us. How you show us your love, that it's eternal. Your goodness towards us is, is, is never ending. Lord, your sovereignty is ever present. All power all-knowing and yet you love us as you would love a child as we would love a newborn you love us all you desire is for us to love you and to worship you thank you for what you do thank you for our church thank you for growing and empowering us to do your work thank you again for all you do. in jesus holy name we pray Amen.